Um, all right, it's our November meeting. It's the 9th at 1130. Thanks for being here. You have a really good turnout. That's awesome. Um, our presenter in a, in a few minutes is going to be uh, Kevin Raber and Jim Ocon. Uh, Jim is a longtime TV engineer, um, and he now has his own uh, company and also runs the uh, Ocon Sorsium, which is a group that uh, there's a, they have a van and with a lot of different technology. And their goal right now is to, they're going on a, a U.S. tour to show off a lot of this new technology, and one of them is drones. So we, uh, they came up to the KJOY, you know, the Briarcrest KYSR site and did some stuff. And that's what Kevin's going to talk about today, how they can help you guys. Uh, you know, they don't just fly and take pretty pictures. They do RF measurements. Um, they do, you know, thermal uh, measurements or, you know, pictures rather. So they do a lot of cool stuff. So uh, moving on, we had a board meeting, our uh, SB 47 board meeting yesterday, as we do every month. Uh, one of the things we decided on, which will be of interest, is we approved a um, good chunk of change for the December holiday party. So as typical, uh, it's going to be virtual. We talked about kind of the issues we ran into trying to get an event. So it will be a virtual party. It is only for SB 47 uh, members. So guests are always allowed to our business meetings, but this is a member only holiday party. Uh, part of that is you, will, you and a guest um, can come or attend and we will be giving Grubhub or Uber Eats uh, gift cards out so you can basically, uh, you know, buy your meal ahead of time. And uh, part of the meeting will be a raffle. And part of the meeting will also be the famous Dick Burden mystery speaker, which is always, uh, uh, which is always a good time. So that's what we're, uh, we're looking to do. Bring your holiday hats. It's going to be different. We know that. But, you know, we wanted to definitely recognize the holiday season and all the stuff we've had to go through the last two years. And, um, it's important. So look for invites probably next week, week after you have to respond. We're going to allow 75 members or 75 people. So member and guests, a lot of that has to do with the zoom. Uh, you know, we can only do a hundred people on the zoom meeting. So, uh, look for that. If you have any questions, reach out to me, let me know. And Kevin is here. All right, Kevin, thank you for being here. We're just finishing up our uh, chapter business and then we'll throw it to you and Jim. So, um, uh, what else is going on in LA? We've had a, a bit of, or a bunch of power reductions in Mount Wilson for Ion TV. It's gone on about a week now. They're requesting about another week uh, of reductions. That's kind of the latest I saw on the email list. Uh, the email list that the SB maintains seems to be going well to my knowledge. If you have any problems, let me know. And now on to SBE news. The uh, newsletter came out this morning, actually. So the board of directors for SBE met on October 11th. Uh, I believe that is posted uh, on the SBE website if you want to take a look at that. Uh, SBE exams coming February 4th through the 14th. Uh, oh, those look good. Okay, I'll grab one. Thank you. <laughs> Got goodies coming my way. All right. Um, so that's coming the 4th through the 14th in February. Uh, Doug is our program chair uh, here in LA. So if you sign up in LA, you'll be doing the test with him. Uh, we have the NS workshop planned for the spring and mentors are needed. They want uh, enrollment in the SB mentoring program uh, is currently going on. Best ways to reach out to Kathy, the SBE, and they're looking for mentors in 2022. I know Doug is part of that program. So if you have any questions, uh, he may be able to ask, answer them. All right, I think that's all I have. Um, Eric or Tony or Gary, do you have any uh, SBE or specific market news you'd like to talk about? Go ahead. Greetings from uh, Phoenix, Arizona and home of SBE uh, chapter nine for all of Arizona. Uh, currently, um, Vertical Bridge is stacking steel on South Mountain for their 300 foot self supporter. They should be at about uh, 240 foot uh, in the next day or so. So they're making great progress there. Uh, Vince Stanton, um, foundation guy, a whiz uh, did uh, the foundations there. And I, I took some before pictures before they backfilled it. I, I can share those eventually, but it's a massive, massive amount of concrete underground. It's it's civil engineering at its finest. It's it's gonna be a great tower and that's gonna benefit iHeart. In fact, uh, Matt, uh, for all their stations in Phoenix it's gonna be on a master antenna and it will result in three guide towers being take, uh, dismantled from South Mountain. There may be other tenants as well. I'm not aware of them at this time. And uh, chapter news, we have not had any um, uh, meetings um, of the board of directors. So we have 
nothing to report at this time. That's it. So are there reductions going on on South Mountain while they're doing all this work? Yes, there is. So um, we had commissioned uh, through the Arizona Broadcasters Association, uh, working with Hammond and Edison, longtime partners in developing the South Mountain Power Reduction and Site Safety Plan. That was revised last uh, in January it came out. So what Vertical Bridge did was contact Raj up there at Hammond and Edison, and they got a um, a grid of power reductions for this construction project. Luckily, it only affects maybe five or six stations. Um, the one it affects most happens to be KYOT and iHeart station, which is close by, but there are a couple of U's in the area that have had to reduce. And of course, the higher you go, uh, different uh, broadcasters are affected. Um, and there is a free climb calculation as well. So. Uh, the one unknown is when they bring in the crane, and maybe they'll do this by gin pole, it's hard to say, um, you know, what effect the RF might have on that. Because when we built the old KJZZ tower, well, it's not all that old, <laughs> it's only about five years old, The uh, and that was on the other side of the hill, we had to do a blanket power reduction. There was so much RF that it messed with the crane instrumentation. So that was one of those unpredictable things, but uh, you roll with the punches. Exactly. All right. Well, thanks, Eric. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank um, you. Uh, Gary or Tony, anything for San Diego? Yeah, let's see. Is Tony with us today? I don't know. I, don't, I didn't see him here listed. Uh, Mike is vice chair. Did you want to say something, Mike? Find the button here. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah. No, uh, although I like your idea for the uh, holiday party. Sounds like a, sounds like a good idea. I'm, uh, well, maybe Gary and I will get together and do something similar. Yeah, so uh, locally here too, uh, it looks like uh, the uh, uh, KOGO towers will be coming down uh, in the next couple of years. Uh, we got the first hint of that uh, last week when 97.3 decided to uh, move over to KGB tower. and. Um, They'll be sharing in an FM uh, antenna at the top there. And um, the first ATSC3 uh, station went on the air last month. Channel 6 here is being used as a kind of a uh, combination Franken FM and uh, ATSC3 station was kind of cool. Um, in a way, it uh, allows one more analog FM channel. Um, and uh, Venture Technologies, who, who put this together for KRPE, um, they are uh, saying that this uh, is ATSC3 compliant so that uh, they don't have to have any special uh, FCC uh, rule changes or or anything, so that's kind of neat. That's all. That's all uh, from here. If you uh, we're, are interested in certification, uh, sign up uh, pretty soon for the uh, February certification tests, and I can administer those. Yeah, little uh, little known fact. I actually took my test with you, Gary. A couple years <laughs> that's ago. right. So. All right. Well, thanks, Gary. I appreciate it. Um, so is any, uh, we're not gonna go into introductions, but does anyone have anything they wanna discuss with the group? Now is the time, so go ahead. Market, SBE, whatever. Okie dokie. Uh, so uh, we're very lucky today to have our, our guest presenter, um, Jim Ocon with the Ocon Sortium and Kevin Raber with QCOM. Uh, I'll let you guys do a better, um, introduction of yourself, but like I was saying, we were up at uh, KYSR, the Briarcrest site. Uh, Kevin did some flying, and we're going to show some of that and talk, he's going to talk about that. And um, we looked at the O-Consortium uh, van of goodies. So, uh, Jim, do you want to start? And sure. uh, you can be in here. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, go ahead. All right, uh, I'm going to unmute my video here, and I'm really going to turn a lot of this over to uh, to Kevin Raber, but let me let me get the right go in the right direction here on the camera here. Hang on. Hang on. Uh, one second. 
Let's see. Yeah. There it goes. Okay. So I'm going to hand this over to Lenore and I'm going to let her be my camera person. Here's Lenore. Hi, wave Lenore. So I'll go ahead and hang my phone. And I just thought uh, I would pan around for a second and say that, first of all, we are located in beautiful, uh, I can't pronounce the name, but we're near, well, go ahead, Lenore. What's the name of the city we're in? I don't want to hack it. What's that? Nagani, Michigan. Nagani, Michigan. And actually right behind me, uh, we're at a great television facility. This is uh, W, what's our call letters? WLUC. WLUC. Here, why don't you, why don't you come here and show our, our, our our guest right in here, this is uh, Chief Engineer. We had just wrapped up a really nice, um, we're three hours ahead here, so we've already finished up all the, the buffalo wings and everything. But what I'd wanna show you is, and, and turn this over to Kevin, is uh, this first of all gives you an example of kind of what we'll do at a, uh, at a regular event. We'll talk about the truck technology, we'll talk about the internet, we'll talk about the various tools that we use, tools that I didn't have available to me when I was building towers. Uh, which I, I can't tell you how excited I was. Uh, thank you, uh, Matthew, for allowing us to visit uh, the fabled Cajo. I started my broadcast career in the Los Angeles area, and I, I was just, it was really cool to be there. And so uh, I don't want to steal Kevin's thunder here. I think what we're going to talk to you about is something that uh, every engineer needs to consider in his or her toolbox. So uh, welcome to the O Consortium Technology Tour. Um, thank you for having us. Uh, Kevin, uh, I'd like to introduce Kevin from uh, Q-Force. He's from the Airborne Division. And Kevin, I'd like you to talk about uh, what your mission is and, and what we did for our friends uh, with Chapter 47. Hi, can everybody hear me? Coming through yes. so, I haven't used this particular setup before, so let me know if you have any trouble hearing us. And I'll mute mine. If you want to take your video, I'll, I'll stop mine. Sounds good. So, as Jim said, uh, we were recently out at the old KJOY site out in Beverly Hills, um, up the Briar Creek site there with Matt. We had the van out on site and we really wanted to kind of close the loop with all that and present to the group and talk about what we were doing in the local area. Um, Jim heads up the Open Sorting Van Tour, which is a collection of all the greatest technologies from all the sponsorships, other partners that are part of the tour. Uh, let him speak to the specific things like the Exelon and the Panasonic equipment and everything that's in the van there. Uh, but where we fit in is Q Force, is the drone and airborne division of Q Communications. And in that, we specialize under Q Communications. And some of you may know Tony and John and the membership of Q Communications. Uh, John, for one, I believe, I don't believe Tony is, but John is an SBE member. Yeah. Um, he's certainly been spending the last 30 or 40 decades or 30, 40 years uh, presenting and, and working with various SBE chapters. So some of you may know him. But under Q Communications, our primary clients are in the broadcast industry. And that's FM, that's AM, that's uh, TV, uh, looking into the ATSC3 expansion and things now. And we provide basically end-to-end, -end, whatever you can dream of, data collection services using drones for that. Our cornerstone of that for many years has been using this rather large monstrosity of a drone here uh, with this particular antenna arrangement. And that's what we may or may not provide services for anybody on here, um, but that's where we do our pattern verification and cover ver verification services under the REPAC program or external to the REPAC program, depending on the client's needs. And under that, we basically take your theoretical model, your theoretical concept of what your antenna pattern should look like, what your coverage area is supposed to be. And we go out there and using the drone and this antenna arrangement here, we'll sample that and we will give you your actual real world for sure path and your real world for sure cover sheet map, you know, what your actual strength is in any given address on the Google Maps that you click on. Um, absolutely enormous and, and impressive amounts of data that you can collect with a drone in that regard. And that's been the cornerstone of our particular business for about a year, about two years now. Go ahead. Okay. 
what's a good sensor, what's a bad sensor, what boxes should be checked. There's a whole host of things that we could be educating ourselves on. I'm very proud to be working uh, with Kevin and his team because we're finding that on these tours, if you will, that the SBE, that the things that we're seeing, we're seeing, wow, we didn't know you could do that, just like how we're with the measurement equipment. And I don't know if that video will be queued up, Kevin, if you're going to play it or Matthew will play it, but we should, if not, I can try to play it up. But I'll, I'm going to turn it back to you just to say that we support a certification program with the SBE. We love working with the LA chapter. You guys are great engineers in a great in a good market and we want to help. No, we are we are talking to SBE Maine, if you will, in Indianapolis, I believe it is. Um, but we are working on a basically an in-house drone education program. And we don't expect to turn every SBE engineer into a drone pilot or get everybody to part number seven virtual drone pilots license. What we're really working at doing is making sure that every member of the SBE has access to this education program and this source material to understand what drones can do, how they can be used, what legal regulations might limit us from doing certain things, and how you might be able to reach out, not just to us, but what you should look for in a professional drone program if you reach out to one. Um, what are the kind of the things that a professional drone program should provide? What services should they be offering to you? Well, what do you have to do? What are your responsibilities? What should they be doing? You know, what does safe flight look like? How do you evaluate the safety of that and the professionalism of that? We're working on putting together a program that helps educate all the SBE engineers, all the channel owners, broadcast owners, station owners out there um, through SBE as to how they can best integrate drones to reach their end needs. You know, what data do you need? How can a drone provide it? And what do you look for in doing that? You know, how do you navigate that from end to end? Um, on top of that, uh, yeah, okay, I, I needed to unmute. I'm sorry. Um, I think we should try to show the video if Matthew wants to cue it up. And I, we've got smart guys. I want to get right into conversation uh, if we could, and I, that might lead us back into some other things. If unless you have any better suggestions, and also you have time, I'd be happy to give you guys a live video tour of the truck if you want to see it. But I think we'd stick straight to the op uh, around K Joy and talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, by all means, I, I think everybody will really benefit from seeing the actual op and kind of seeing some of the thermal stuff in flight. And we'll be talking about that day. And we'll be around for questions after that. Yeah, Jim, do you maybe want to um, do the truck? Because I'm going to need a few minutes to get this queued oh, up. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. No, no worries. I'd love to do the truck. So I'm going to talk over it. And I'll give an overview because that way I know where to point the camera. So I'll start on the outside. How long do I have, Matt? Five minutes? Three minutes? Uh, Five-ish. Five-ish. Okay. So um, this is the Oconsortium technology truck. Now, I'm on, uh, I've been in the broadcast industry myself at least 30 years. I formed a company called Ocon Solutions about three and a half years ago. And as part of that effort, because I know on the vocational side, what's missing and whatnot, I created the O Consortium, which is created, it's like a nonprofit. And we're made up of companies and individuals to help solve workflow issues. So we went and got the, the support of the Advanced Television Standards Committee, Society of Broadcasting Engineering, A1 Alliance. I'm actually a board member on Veterans TV. Uh, and of course, uh, we have SIMPTI. Notice the new logo on SIMPTI. And then you have to be a member in our in our consortium. We have working groups. We have a, uh, a lab. We have a spectrum initiative working group led by Howard Fine. Those of you in the LA area would know Howard. He's a good friend of mine. And we are creating a national interference database. Uh, Sinclair, along with their lab, they've done a lot to promote next generation television. Let's not forget our friends on the radio either. So this is meant to be all encompassing. And so everybody that's in the consortium is a member. You'll see there. There's QCon, there's our airborne division sticker right there. Wave relay relates to the, the mesh manet gear. I still have some out here left over from our op. This is really cool stuff. This is all super secure, militarized, waterproofed, uh, you know, encrypted uh, gear. This is really awesome. The truck now is designed to do glass to glass next gen transmission. That's acquisition and transmission. We carry an ATSC transmitter on board. The systems that were built by our coach builder, Accelerated Media, they're the hood ornament. It's pretty cool. The truck, you'll notice there's no generator running right now, and she's fully powered up. She'll run probably about four hours on a full load. 
and she uses uh, actually two different. Uh, let me come around here to the power. Got to forgive me as I run around the truck here. This is a 2017 Ford Transit. The dog is out as optional, and uh, it's a diesel. Uh, it's a five-cylinder diesel. And then what you got under here? Let's get, let's get this poked up. So in the engine compartment, this side here, this is called a MEPS, an MVP power side. This is three, I think it's three and a half kilovolts or five and a half kilovolts of voltage. So it's got two alternators. This will feed a bank of batteries right over here. So these batteries then obviously juice the vehicle. And then if you would come around to where traditionally in any live truck or whatever, where your, your generator would be right here, instead, Okay, you got your beer fridge. So uh, two and a half hours, so no gas, no, uh, no uh, very, very clean power. This has a, uh, it actually has two different short ties on board. The truck is capable of quite a little bit. We have base stations with uh, one inch CCD HDR cameras. That's a television exciter. We can pull a PLP stream. Uh, right off of the truck. We just did a speed test a little bit ago. I think we had about 150 meg down and 60 megabits up with the vehicle. Um, the cameras that we're using are one inch CCD, just for examples of that. We have a pretty cool little one, U150 here. This is a 4K camera and I've got it pointed towards that tower up there because we can use it to do tower inspections. <laughs> it's kind of fun, just tilt this thing around. Um, and then the truck is meant to set up to do training or demonstrations. So in order to do that, you need internet. We have an internet system provided by Jero, that's a gateway. And then we've got a couple edge devices if you want to use their encoding, kind of like a TV or a live view. And then we have, Hey Jim, Jim, if you can, uh, Jim, if you can hear me, you may want to go outside. Your audio is pretty robotic. <laughs> yeah, still not the greatest. Okay, with the cell phone, show here. This is what we have to do. This device will do. All right, how, how, how about we do this real quick? We'll give you a sec to reset because uh, you, you were better a few seconds ago. So, how about we play the yeah. video? We'll do the video now and uh, then we'll come back to you. How does that sound? I'll try one more. Oh, there you go. All right. That's better. Go ahead. Yeah, I may have been Bluetooth. I don't know. I, guys, you know, what, what can I say? Uh, what I'm trying to show is the uh, Hexalon test equipment, which has about seven pieces of test equipment rolled into it. It has a Wi-Fi analyzer, an LTE analyzer, a radio analyzer with a drive around meter, a next gen meter, um, really a lot of really, um, here, let me, and. Go this guy here. So what I'm trying to show you here is that, that this, this piece of equipment that has everything from a, uh, it can analyze fiber, it can analyze spectrum, including radio, it has network diagnostic tools, so you can ping and do things such as, uh, let's go to this, well, here's, here's our Wi-Fi analyzer. We'll pop this up and notice the tour, the Ocon tour trucks are on the left and these are the other Wi-Fi's that are around. Um, this, this will give you a lot of market intelligence as to who's doing what. This net tools is kind of interesting for your IT people. You can ping and do speed tests on your own network. So again, to recap, this piece of equipment has about seven pieces of test gear rolled into it. 
very, very nicely, very well calibrated. Just a nice piece of gear. It allows us to verify uh, next gen or radio or whatever you want to do and what services they're carrying and whatnot. And to cap it all off, you know, the truck is designed to show capture. Uh, we can stream with it. We can do uh, Remy or cloud productions, that type of stuff. It really just kind of depends on on what we're after. So I hope that filled up enough time um, for you, Matthew, to get the video ready. And I'm real glad you guys are able to see us. And I hope uh, we come. Oh, one more thing, um, veterans. Uh, so if you know of anybody that's active duty in the military that wants to transition to civilian life, you know, we want to help the, these people get jobs in the TV industry. In fact, uh, my first project is a ET-1 nuclear is serving on board a ballistic missile submarine and gets out in about nine months, wants to learn editing. And uh, so I, I would think that those of us in the military or ex-military would really serve really well in, in the civilian roles in helping our country get rebuilt. So that's what the veterans uh, car is about. And I hope you'll support me in that effort. So with that, I'm gonna turn this back over to Matthew. I hope you guys can still hear me. If you want to get involved, just email you or I'm sorry, so repeat that. You know, I said if people want to get involved in the veteran project, they just email you or oh thank you. Yeah. Well, please join the O Consortium. It's a nonprofit or we're run as a nonprofit. We don't charge professional members such as yourselves for dues. I need your help on these working groups. Howard Fine. I think a lot of us in the LA area are looking for leadership and how we're gonna do spectrum management. So the veteran side, we have a veterans working group. Bruce Hart, former fire controlman is the chairman of that group. And we are going to be spinning up all of our meetings. So uh, please email, either go to my website, go to you can go to the oconsortium.org website or Ocon Tech Tour. You can go to my company. You can send me an email if you like. Uh, let me know you're interested in the veterans program. Does that help? And you want to give my email right now. I'm jim.ocon, O-C-O-N, at oconcompany.com. Six years, U.S. Navy, uh, US, San Diego and Long Beach, and a lot of other great place people in this room. I recognize some of you, and it's great to see, you know, after COVID. So, uh, all right. Well, I hope that filled out enough time, and thank you for the opportunity, Matthew. I, I really appreciate it. Hello, uh, my name is Jim Ocon, president of the Ocon Consortium, and today I am at formerly known as the KJOY uh, radio site above the Hollywood Hills. It is now uh, Briar Crest. the Briar Crest. I'm with uh, my good friend, Matt. Matt Anderson. Matt Anderson. <clears throat> and Matt Anderson is actually the local SBE chair. And Matt uh, was gracious enough to invite us up to his facility up here at the wonderful Hollywood Hills. I, I started out my career in this market, so, and as an RF guy, I'm just... I'm just very excited to be here. So what I thought I would do is just give you a quick overview of the of the why we're here and the truck. Um, like I said before, my name is Jim Ocon. I'm president of the Ocon Consortium. Around three and a half years ago, I created a consultancy company, but I realized that we needed uh, better conversation and better training in the industry. So I created the Ocon Consortium, sort of run like a nonprofit, but we're made up of companies and individuals meant to look at workflow. Uh, and basically, especially after post-COVID workflow, all the things we ought to be doing. So um, I started off by getting wonderful support from the Advanced Television Standards Committee. It's a shout out to Madeline Nolan, wonderful supporter. Uh, of course, uh, Jim Ragsdale and, and his team at the Society of Broadcast Engineering. We have uh, Bob Lavoyevich with Veterans Television. We have, uh, um, excuse me, A1, the A1 Alliance, that's, J, that's uh, John Lawson. Barbara Lang, uh, Executive uh, Director of SIMPTI, the Society of Motion Picture Television. So very important that we have all the standards. And then inside of this, we have all these other guys that are supporters. So we have the folks at One Media uh, and Sinclair. They're help pushing next-gen television. Friends like Tejero, Panasonic, Televis, Persistent Systems. The truck builder is literally the hood, hood ornament. Accelerated Media, Tom Jennings. The truck itself is, I think, uh, a thing of beauty, and we can get into some of the power systems uh, and that sort of thing. So. Uh, that's a quick overview of at least the uh, uh, of the logos and whatnot. And you'll notice some we've got some toys around here. Now, what does the truck do? Well, the truck's capable. We call it our mobile demonstration training unit. This truck has extremely robust high-speed internet. It has uh, spectrum analysis uh, equipment on board. It has production systems on board. We can fly tethered and untethered drones. You can see those in front of me. We have good representations of. PTZs. This is a Panasonic U150, which is a 4K uh, camera. In fact, uh, 
this room. Go ahead and let's open up the door here. And uh, you can go ahead and look at the, we're actually pointed right at their tower. And this is the 150. Let's pull it out. Go ahead and uh, show them a shot of the actual DTZ itself. Okay, and then let's go back to here. Again, so I'm kind of doing a little a little fake tower inspection here using my little Panasonic U150. So, anyways, in, inside the vehicle here we have a lot of a lot of cool things. Uh, it's in order to demonstrate uh, workflows, cloud to ground, ground to cloud. You need an internet connection. So, Dejero is providing us a very fast, very secure internet connection. We've had speeds uh, of up uh, up to 100 down and 100 up uh, with the connection. There's actually a network of antennas on the roof of this vehicle bringing in various subscriber connections as well. Um, so the Dejero is bringing in our internet and we have a uh, video distribution system that's centralized by Panasonic IP based or a hybrid production switcher. So this switcher is designed to be controlled remotely as well as uh, locally. We just have it here. You can pretend that this is your local studio and you're bringing in a lot of clean feeds from all your big games and you're switching them here. So this is the Hero system. Uh, moving down here, we've got something really cool. This is called the Hexalon. Now, the Hexalon is a spectrum analyzer. It's a Wi-Fi detector. It's a TV analyzer. Uh, let me just play with it for a second here. Let's go to the uh, Wi-Fi analy uh, wi analyzer. So it's going to go ahead and we have it connected to the house antenna. And you see these bubbles right here? These are various Wi-Fi signals. And you'll notice the Ocon Tour Truck is the largest signal around. Uh, I think we're not we're stealing anybody's bandwidth, but bandwidth is very important to us. And again, the Hexalon is designed to do a lot of very unique things. Uh, one one thing that we're trying to do is teach people about next generation television. And Los Angeles, I know they are getting ready to launch, but you will need a device like this to be able to verify and measure your ATSC next generation signal. So you'll notice on this screen here, uh, look, look who we have up. Um, looks like we've got KCOP. There's a, this is an ATSC 10. There's your power level. Here's your, uh, MER, nice MER, 29 is a nice number. Uh, notice the pilot on your carrier. Um, lots of really cool things that you can do with this device here. You can, you can actually look and verify your services. Same thing with radio. It has an FM radio detector. Let's go to that. Let's see here. Radio analyzer. Now, I haven't seen this one yet. We'll have to have someone from Tel Aviv uh, come on here and play with this. But this device, uh, and it's a, a very small form factor, allows remote control. You can leave it and forget about it. You can uh, have over the shoulder uh, interaction with it. Obviously, I'm showing you how to do that in here. It's got uh, uh, land connections, and it's just a really, really versatile piece of equipment. We're very happy to have it here. Um, again, moving over to the rack, it's just basically a, 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 an HDMI fed truck layer two. We've got some basic routing on board. We've got our internet. We've got our, IP, our IP-based production. And uh, to, to cap off, I know I'm coming back around to the internet, but you notice the Dejero, we even have a, a backup Dejero system. So if we wanted to just to talk about technology, we may need ways to have a, someone give us their workflow on the Amazon cloud. And this truck can do that. Let's go around to the back. Let me show you the racks. Let's let's we'll talk about the truck. And you'll notice that the truck that there's no generator running or anything right now. The truck has a very powerful MEPS uh, system in it, and that means it has two alternators. There's a. I'll take you around to the front a little bit to show you the alternator. It pumps out 6.5 kVA of voltage, feeding the inverter, which generates the voltage. On this side of the truck here, there's actually battery, and it'll run for probably a couple hours, just on full load, just on battery alone, and. Guess where the spot for the generator, you've got a, there's your beer fridge, okay? Um, very happy to, but again, you know, for a crew to have clean power, short tie connections, uh, efficient power, and uh, a safe operation with no no gas to worry about, again, I'm very, I think it's a good example of, uh, as far as truck systems. Now, the rack here that we have, uh, you've got, uh, the truck is capable of glass to glass, transmission and reception of television signals, uh, including uh, ATSC next-gen signals. And we actually have an exciter that was provided to us by One Media Labs. This is a, uh, uh, I think it's an acridine box, but we can pull a 25 megabit PLP stream properly formatted with guide 
uh, signaling data, all of that comes straight over here. Let's pretend you've lost your STL. We're up here and the earthquake has, has happened and your STL is now out of alignment. Well, you could take this truck and turn it on and pull a satellite signal or pull an internet wherever you're getting it and essentially replace your STL with an IP stream. And we can do this glass to glass. If you have a drone, this tether, you could actually take that, put an antenna on the drone, fly it up the air, and guess what? You have an emergency operations uh, capability. So that's what we mean by glass to glass. It's not set up here, but I have a Sony Bravia um, TV we used to demonstrate. This is just right out of the box from Best Buy, you know, 300 bucks or whatever, and this is your next gen television. So uh, that's what we have here. So I hope I didn't go too fast. Um, I kind of went down the rack with seat. Oh, we started, we've got some, uh, we've got a computer to pull the PLP screen. We have a couple base stations. The Panasonic equipment is really cool. Uh, it, these base stations are fiber fed. And what we have here is we've got, um, we've got some HDR capable one inch CCD cameras uh, by Panasonic. Those are pretty neat to look at. So to cap it all, you've got power, you've got internet, you've got camera um, acquisition, uh, distribution capabilities over the internet, um, signal measurement capabilities, drones. What else I leave out? I think we got it pretty well covered. I think what we're going to do is do another op here and, and, and do some drone operations and, and talk about the drones. Hi, Kevin Raber with Q Communications, uh, representing Q Force, the actual airborne division of Q Communications out here on the O Consortium Van Tour. And just wanted to give the SBE team a rundown of what we're providing for drone services, both in support of the O Consortium Van Tour and as part of our service packages that we offer to radio stations, TV broadcast, uh, news broadcast organizations, inspections of all sorts. I'd like to start over on this end. Uh, this is the one that's probably most interesting to everybody as a member of SBE. This is our SE8, an American built drone platform. We use this under Q Communications uh, in order to service the repack program, where we use this module here mounted on this large drone here. Uh, and we will actually fly pattern verification and coverage verification missions in order to support pre and post inspection installs of new antennas. Uh, basically everything and anything under the sun in support of the repack program is generally flown off this massive platform right here. Uh, moving over this way, we get into where we do a lot of our visual inspection work with this platform. This one right now is set up to do a thermal visual inspection, where we do a lot of thermal visual inspection, everything from solar panel farms to electrical runs, looking for resistance and other issues on the electrical lines, uh, and have recently been doing quite a bit looking for nitrogen leaks. Um, and then we'll do visual inspections where we will actually do a pre-tower climber safety check, uh, pre-tower climber safety mapping, and we'll do visual inspections for insurance support and structural analysis of a drone pre, uh, pre-catastrophic event, post-catastrophic event, before a hailstorm, before a hurricane comes in, before an earthquake, um, in order to support what might be, need, might be needing to be fixed on the tower. So rather than send a tower climbing team up, we'll look at it with the drones first, and then when we do send a team up, at least they know what they're going for, they can reduce their time on the tower, they can check all their safety apparatuses on a damaged tower before they ever climb it. And as we work our way down into the spectrum, we get into our smaller drones, something that's more familiar to everyone. But basically we're using professional level versions of what you can buy at a Best Buy or off any given electronic store shelf. But we're using those for autonomous missions in order to generate 3D models and 2D maps of a given area. We can fly that with a relatively inexpensive drone, keep it up in the air over the course of an hour or two, get all of 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 photos. And we'll combine that into an actual 3D map of a structure that an engineering team or a sales team can actually go look at and manipulate and see in three dimensions and move around uh, using what we generate off of that platform. Okay, thank you so much, Kevin. And uh, you covered some pretty good ground here. Can you talk about the differences on the uh, on the images of the sensors? Because I, I don't want to just joke and say you got Bob's Drone Company, but I know there's got to be some qualitative differences on the sensors that are used. Can you? discuss that for yeah, a little absolutely. bit so we will we'll fly a mission here for you shortly and we'll actually go over we'll fly oh we'll go and high okay. optical stuff but jim brings up a really good point and that's simply that drones are a data collection platform uh, at the end of the day they're basically a vehicle carrying a sensor and what really matters is the quality of the sensor and the ability of somebody to interpret the data off that sensor here in america we're the only ones flying this particular rf sensor and the ability we have to extrapolate data off of that to get an actual real world pattern for your tower match it up to your theoretical pattern if all's going well or inform you if the patterns don't match up and the ability to fly it all over the area and actually do a coverage heat map those are just abilities that nobody else has and that comes from both having the quality sensor and having the right software packages to interpret that data can you point out the various components on here sure so this here is our actual rf sensor box this is what we'll use to actually map a pattern 
FM, AM, whatever the pattern may be, TV broadcast has been the big one under the Repack program for some time now. On the drone itself, really all the sensors you see here and the antennas are going to be your uplink and downlink antennas um, under the drone. And then on top of the drone, you're going to see your various GPS and RTK, which is basically a highly detailed, highly accurate uh, GPS antenna. That way, when we are mapping these things, when we're looking at your pattern, when we're doing our checks, you're actually getting location data with about a meter or less of accuracy. Um, if we have to on some of these other drones for the models and everything, we can get down to sub-centimeter level accuracy on some of the inspections. But that way, you're actually getting real-world, real accurate data. Um, for those that are familiar with GPS, you know, the GPS on your phone with a 3 to 10 meter level of accuracy is just not enough for the level of fidelity that we try right. to provide in these inspections. The same kind of principles apply over here on the thermal side. You know, we want top of the line sensors for sure. You, you are not going to be able to get cheap sensors when it comes to these sorts of missions. But more than just collecting the data, it's knowing what to collect, but it's knowing how to interpret that data. Right. So while the sensor itself makes for a very pretty picture, you know, you want the highest resolution possible. What we have the ability to do is go in and actually measure the temperature of every single pixel in there. So as we go and do post analysis of a mission, that's where we're really getting the data from is going in there, processing this in post, and then actually going in there and analyzing pixel by pixel. Do you have a nitrogen leak that we're able to detect because of the temperature difference, the cloud that is coming off your antenna? Do you have a resistance issue or a kink of the line or some other electrical issue because we can see the actual heating up of that area, the high resistance in that area? Solar panel farms, do you have a photovol photovolytic cell that is going bad because we can see that one heating up? So a lot of that data is learning to compare relative temperatures from A to B and being able to analyze that in the proper software after the fact. And then on the modeling side, it's the exact same thing. It's you, Not everybody can take two 3,000 photo data sets and then turn that into a highly accurate, high fidelity 3D model. So it really comes down to your ability to post-process and, and model a lot of this data, whether it be on the RF side, the thermal and visual inspection side, or the three-dimensional point cloud that we can generate off the smaller drones. That's uh, highly informative. It's certainly not your dad's drone. You know, I mean, this is this is definitely a, a step above. Well, what do you say we go flying? Let's go flying. Hi, Kevin Raber again with Q Communications, uh, flying with Q Force, the airborne division of Q Communications. We're going to demonstrate with one of our drones sitting out here the thermal inspection capabilities that we have for some of our towers. Uh, and then we'll swap into one of our high optical zoom lenses over time. Uh, but really just want to show you the ability to move this drone's imagery through the band, broadcast live imagery through the actual band itself. And then of course, what we're actually inspecting, what we're actually seeing with the drone and what value can be provided by a drone on the physical inspection side, as well as the RF inspection side. Uh, so let's go ahead and fly, and I'll let Jim show you what it yeah, looks like. Yeah, and Kevin, as we go, what what licensing is required, and can you talk about the uh, some of the uh, some of the FCC um, um, boxes that have yep. to be checked no, before you do something like this? So every one of the pilots flying with Q Force is a full time professional pilot. That means they hold a Part 107 pilot's license, which is your drone small UAS pilot's license. Um, every one of them is fully certified, fully insured. They go through additional training when they come to us. They come to us with a pilot's license and then go through all the additional training to be specialists in this technical collection field, whether it be RF collection, uh, visual collection, thermal collection. We get them certified in all vers all different sorts of um, collection fields there. One big thing about all our pilots is they all get additional training in on-site safety, how to navigate the FAA approval process, how to navigate and understand the FCC process, really understand the signals that they're collecting so they can ensure the quality of those signals and the collection out in the field. You take an area like this, um, and what our pilots will do is before they ever come on a mission, they will have already looked at this area, evaluated this area for FAA restricted flight areas, temporary flight restriction zones, anything of the sort. They would have evaluated the tower and the RF energy on the tower to decide if any of it was a danger to the drone. And they would have coordinated all that with whatever waivers they need, whatever licensing they need to fly in this airspace. This area in particular, we're actually between two major airports and their approach paths. Uh, but we've gone ahead and we've gotten the waivers and notified the airports that we're flying drones in the area. Uh, we are not in any restricted airspace up here, and we'll be staying within proximity to this location that will allow us to fly up to 400 feet above ground level or above the actual tip of the tower itself. These are all the things our pilots will navigate before they ever even set foot on site. That way, by the time they get out on site, they already know that they can fly, what their regulations are, what additional rules or coordinations it might take that day. Uh, if there's a, say, presidential TFR, a temporary flight restriction that got dropped that day that prohibits drone flights, they've already made all those coordinations. That way they're not wasting the engineer's time on site. They're not going out there and dragging the equipment halfway across the country for an area they can't fly. And of course, they're flying as safe as possible and within the legal, you know, within the legal ramifications and legal limits, both by the FAA and the FCC, local government, state government, federal government. We navigate all that for you so it never has to be done on the other client's end. 
So I'll go ahead and get ready to fly, Jim, and okay. take on a tour of the van. Okay. Well, what we've got here is on our presentation monitors, we've got uh, the on-screen display up. All right, we got the thermal system up in the air right now. Uh, we're pushing the thermal video into the truck. If this was a 4K broadcast, we could push that into the truck and rebroadcast it. Uh, but one ability that we really have that a lot of people are starting to really find valuable is the ability to push a feed out to an engineering team somewhere else in the country. So if your engineering team is in Nashville uh, and you have towers up in Chicago, towers out in the Midwest, we can actually go do that inspection and the engineering team can actually be seeing that inspection in real time and essentially tell the pilot what they want to look at and the pilot will act as their eyes and navigate the tower for that. We can do it over Teams, over Zoom, or any of these other common platforms. You know, we do that by pumping it through uh, Zoom or Teams, just the same way we're pumping it through the van here. So I'll go ahead and fly around the tower a little bit. We'll take a look at some of the thermal issues on the tower, see if we see anything uh, that stands out. Uh, and Jim can walk you through some yeah, of the systems which, that are going on here. Yeah, and which tower are we at currently? Uh, can we describe where we are? Yeah, it's uh, uh, Vertical Bridge site, Briarcrest, Hollywood Hills, uh, 90210. 90210, okay. Here we go. Oh, it looks like we switched over to uh, thermal or IR, and uh, this is pretty fascinating. So what I'm what I'm seeing here are the various heat signatures coming off of uh, various items: uh, waveguide, transmission line, um, steel, essentially. And uh, here we're looking at what, are you, Kevin? What are you basically looking for? on this sort of scan. So right now what we're seeing is that the tower is very uniform in temperature. That's because it's the middle of the day. The sun has been soaking it for a while. If we were flying something where we wanted to see the resistance of the electrical lines, if we wanted to see an issue there, we'd probably fly this very early in the morning where the tower was cool, but the lines were hot. For something like this though, this is the time of day we would fly if we wanted to see a nitrogen leak or anything like that, because we want that colder stuff, you know, that colder temperature to really jump out at us. So what you're seeing right now is a false color representation of basically the infrared or thermal spectrum. And as we go up, you're gonna see that everything is largely uniform. It's all been sitting in the same sun all day long. Um, you'll see the cooler sky behind it that kind of gives it some contrast. But what we're tracing up right now is actually one of the uh, main electrical runs and probably the nitrogen run of this particular tower. And there's your elements. We can, of course, switch that back to wow. a normal view here. So what's your flight? visual inspection. So you'll notice it's a well. this is 1080p HD video, and I can see the shading on the paint. I can tell, I can see the bolts. Yeah. Uh, I can see the discolorization. I can tell even how orange the dielectric paint is on that antenna. I can see where the sun's been hitting it harder. I can see where the paints bubbled. Really interesting. Um, very. Now go, can you go back to thermal real quick, just on that waveguide, and zoom in where you were? So same shot. He is not the the drone is stationary. It's and really, I think we got about a five knot wind. There uh, we go. Looks like winds are about five and a half right now. Five and a half. Hey, Good I guess. guess, huh? <laughs> Good guess. Na Navy man. So here's your thermal. Check that out. Now, if I saw a, a, a discolorization, I may, I may think I've got a hot spot on that. Like on a cold day, it'd be a good day to see that antenna, I think. Check that out. And again, it's not so much what we record here and see here. It's about the raw data we collect here that we can then analyze later on. And that's where we can go pixel by pixel, bolt face by bolt face, and actually analyze the raw data and really extrapolate the more valuable data sets that are being recorded. It's not just about what you see with your eyes, it's about the data that's being recorded underneath all that, the metadata that we can analyze later. Let me see if I can find you on the PTZ, on the Panasonic U150. There we go. And where are you? Is he to the left, yeah. to the left still? And he's in the sun. Oh, he's in the sun? Okay. Well, anyway, he's around here somewhere. I thought I would pop him up and show the drone. On the on the 150 here. What's the flight used, time, Kevin? Out of the shot. Uh, for this particular one with this sensor, about an hour. Oh, really? Yep. Okay. Okay. Well, let's go back to the drone video itself. Let's see here. Where are you, drone? Drone. If we wanted to do broadcast video, we can remove all the actual extra data on there. Yeah. So if you were doing this, if it was a live shot, 
you know, you could basically just try that. Are you seeing the clear? clear yep. Now? Yep. Completely clear. Really sharp video, though. I really, I mean, yeah, it's if cool. you look at it, it's 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 amazing just to see the detail. Yeah, I can. It, this tells me an awful lot. It really does. There's an element there. Yep. Yeah, well. I can count the bolts. So I know that this company has discovered issues with other uh, towers not being plumbed correctly or center radiation being off or beam tilt being incorrect. Um, this is the, as they say, as a favorite president of mine said, trust but verify. Um, these tools were not available when I was building towers. Um, I do think a lot of considerations need to be made for uh, safety, uh, making sure you have a licensed uh, operation, uh, that you're using quality sensors, that you have people that know how to analyze and interpret the data. But again, these are tool sets that were not available to us just a few years ago. You combine these things together, I think you can see the, uh, uh, the, the effectiveness of such a tool. So Kevin, anything else you want to go over here as we're, uh, I see you're just uh, yep. playing we're just around. A little manual flying. Right a little manual now, flying. Um, doing some pandas around the tower and such. Really, at the end of the day, we can collect any data out there. It's just it's communicating with the customer and learning the data they want and then helping them realize what can be done with that data. A lot of people have this idea that they'd like to just see photos of the tower, but we show them a 3D model and it's just utterly mind blowing the data that can be collected there. A lot of people say I want a thermal, um, but they don't really understand the underlying metadata and the analysis of that pixel by pixel thermal data, you know, being more than a pretty picture. You know, a lot of people say I want to know my pattern and we can actually show them this is what the pattern that you were promised, you know, from the company, from the manufacturer, from the installer, here's your pattern that was promised, but here's your pattern in real life and you're off by 11 degrees, 15 degrees, we've seen that. Sometimes there are people that don't really wanna know that, um, but at the end of the day, it's always good to know what the problem is. And then before tower climber crew ever goes up there, now they're not going up there looking for problems, the drone has found the problems, the climbing crew now can actually go up there, be on site less time, less wandering around on the tower and actually just focus on fixing a problem. So there's a really huge safety benefit to using the drones in this way before a tower climbing crew ever gets on site. So in, uh, you know, radio, nitrogen leak's pretty common one to sound a, a yep. tower crew up. So what would be the approach to that for you guys? Uh, so we recently did another tower out in Oklahoma um, to detect a nitrogen leak. Uh, I believe we actually have two more that are looking at a similar problem. And what we generally do is we'll come out, if you have a nitrogen leak, we'll fly that during a warmer part of the day so the cooler nitrogen stands out. You know, that pressurized system really stands out to us a little more. But we'll go up there, we'll analyze the run-up line. Uh, basically, as we fly up, we're, be, we're watching the line. But I think anybody that's dealt with this in the past, almost across the board, the leak is always at the antenna junction somewhere up in that area. Um, so then we'll get a real detailed look. We'll do a complete orbit system around the antenna. And we'll basically be looking for that cooler temperature leaking out of there. And that way, when the tower climber crew goes up there, they're not going step-by-step step looking for the leak. They're going up to where the leak is suspected to be and they're simply verifying it and then fixing it as opposed to searching for it. Right, so now instead of a climbing crew being on site for six, eight, 10 hours, they're on site for two hours and they're not wandering around the tower, they're not distracted by other work, they just simply go right to where the source of the problem is. Excellent, this is a very informative, uh, Kevin. And this is again, this is Kevin Raber, Raber for, with QForce, QCOM, the Airborne Flight Division and they are uh, part of the Yoke Consortium Technology Tour and. Again, uh, really appreciate this overview, Kevin. Nice job. All right. Um, so obviously, really cool. <laughs> uh, I had a great time with you guys up there. Let me stop sharing my screen. And if you okay. want, we can edit down a smaller version that some that you guys want to see in full motion video. I apologize for the Zoom jerkiness, but I hope the audio came through. Yeah, uh, and I was just going to say, too, that, um, you know, appreciate you being there, Kevin. You're extremely knowledgeable and, uh, you know, very professional. I was extremely impressed with, uh, with you guys' company. So uh, does anyone have any questions for Kevin or uh, what drones can do for us for Tower? Uh, go ahead.
Yeah, please. We love the questions, and I think we need to have the discussion. Is anybody here flying drones? Has anybody considered flying a drone? Has anybody had any drone incidents? Yeah, so I, yeah, I'll speak up. So yeah, my uh, my dad has a drone, and we've done some stuff with our uh, in desert sites. You know, more just of beauty shots than any sort of data collection. But you know, you make an interesting point that it's not just the pictures you're collecting; it's you know what those pictures can do for you when it comes to a model or you know really what you're after. So. Oh, robots, ro robots, back, Jim. <laughs> They want to get off the Bluetooth. All right, we'll pass it. Maybe it that, uh, how's that? Yeah, it seems to it. me that drones, when drones came out, all the major groups all ran out and hired drone pilots, right? But nobody knows what they're doing. How's that for a shot across the bow? <laughs> Like we should have the engineers running this stuff, not the producers. The engineers can show. I mean, we flipped it. I don't understand why I went out and they're they're getting content, but they're not even sharing the content. Whereas these these are tools that could mean a lot more for the business. I mean, I know of a station in a large group that went off the air. A new station, if they had checked for their nitrogen leak using this, they wouldn't have been off the air. I don't know how else to explain it. And Matt, you know, or Kevin. You can't say who, but you know what I'm talking about. There's only two companies out there can build above a thousand or two thousand feet, and you're it's some slightly embarrassing situations, right, Kevin? Like, hey, you're po you're not pointed the right way. Am I correct? Oh no, what what Jim's referring to? I mean, what we find with the PVs and the CVs, the pattern verifications, the public verifications, is more often than not, your real world data does not match up to your theoretical data provided by whoever your antenna manufacturer is, you know, maybe it was installed on the tower wrong, maybe the antenna has been damaged along the lines, but having the actual real world data and knowing that that data is accurate and knowing that that data is, you know, certified through this and approved by the FCC and everything, it's, you're working on a data set that up to this point has just never been available um, with this level of accuracy and this level of safety as well in its collection, so. Yeah, I would imagine interference collection would be helpful. Uh, Howard and I and Somebody's are doing an interference database, and I would think that drones could help out uh, verifying interference and sources of interference, as well as, you know, is your tower plumbed correctly? I don't care if you're doing an, F, an FM or a low power, but mechanical tilt, beam tilt, vertical polarization, horizontal polarization, all of these things, I mean, count. And, you know, as a Navy guy, I can just say that these are things that absolutely you'd want to do. Why would you not want to have this stuff? You know, and maybe you got shared sites with shared uh, services. I mean, it's not inexpensive to fly, but why, you know, let's do it. Let's do it correctly. I, I would like to know what other sensors we could maybe put on these drones. Is anybody, you got a lot of smart people in this room. What are we missing here? We talked about thermal, RF. I thought about science. Is anything, what else could these things, I mean, anybody want to throw in? I, you know, I think this is one of those things that we don't, a lot of us don't have, you know, uh, a lot of experience or kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, we, haven't, we haven't dealt with it a lot. So I think, you know, we're just kind of in the process where we're taking in all the information of what we can do for it. And, I, you know, I know even I'm thinking of things in the future, uh, you know, if we have a nitrogen leak or something else. I'll definitely think, well, hey, is that a, something a drone could be useful for? You know, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it's social. We're trying to socialize. I saw Chris Hayes' hand up. I'm sorry, Chris. Oh, I was just going to uh, rephrase. I think I got unmuted. Yes, I got unmuted. Uh, I, I asked this question before, but I think it was misunderstood. Being a longtime AM directional guy, what obviously comes to my mind first is this might be an improved way to do AM directional proof of performance because you wouldn't have to deal with things on the ground. One of the problems with the conventional method is you're taking a field set through neighborhoods of different sizes, wires everywhere, and the only way we get a reading is by taking a bunch of readings along a radial with a guy driving between all of the things and on like 10 you know, multiple radials, very time consuming. 
process. Uh, I was wondering if you've done any thinking about that with the caveat that it would That's probably require question. an FCC rule change. To yeah, you're saying implement. ground planes on AM. I'm an old AM. I mean, I don't, I don't AM like you guys do, but I know ground planes are measured differently. You have long wavelength, right? So you're saying an aerial uh, view of that RF vertical or horizontal plane, depending on its model, you can, you're saying that you won't have as much ground clutter. You're up above it and you can, is that what you're asking that we can, that's. Well, it has to do, I, <clears throat> I would, I would hesitate to use ground clutter, clutter because that means different things to pilots than it does to uh, RF sure. guys. But uh, basically what I'm saying is it would be a low fly because you'd want to be more or less near the center of the tower line or, or as, low as you could do that. I mean, there might be obstacles. Well, AM on. day sites are low, correct? They're down on a low. They're on the ground, yes. They're on, on the, the ground. ground. And the, uh, I was just wondering if you looked at exploring that, I think, someone correct me if I were, were wrong, I think it would probably require a rules change for it to be used for real legally. Uh, this is not like the repack where everybody's, you know, all kind of in the same boat and, uh, AMs are already pretty packed. They don't. Uh, I wonder what Howard Fine would have to say about this. Um, and I think it's an excellent question. Uh, Kevin, we're talking about measurement possibilities for drones on AM sites. Yeah, no, I, I can't speak to the FCC's rules as far as what they would accept or what an insurance company accepts on an individual basis as far as inspections go or things like that. I don't know what the FCC accepts on an individual basis if you have reporting requirements to them. Um, that's not really my purview. What I can say is that we've never come across something when it came to data that we couldn't find a way to collect with drones if somebody could conceive of the need. At the end of the day, the, the drone is a vehicle. You know, it, it's the semi truck that hauls a trailer, and the truck doesn't care what is in the trailer. It gets from A to B that way. And the drone's the same concept. If you have a need or can imagine a use case, or more, more accurately, imagine a data set that you might be beneficial of this, might be more efficient, must, might be safer, um, might be able to be collected in a way that's never been collected before. Uh, this drone is, is completely agnostic to the sensor that is on it. It is not strictly RF, not strictly thermal, not strictly visual. We can develop a sensor or manufacture a sensor from scratch or find one that's already on the market. We have all sorts of sensors that were not made for drones especially on the telecom side that we now attach to drones and we're collecting data that's just never been collected data collected in that way before. So, you know, when it comes to AM, I, I am not the expert. Uh, my radio background gives me some grounding in the knowledge of AM and, uh, you know, HF radio and everything, um, many years of dealing with that in special operations. And I can't conceive of something I did there where I would not have been able to attach to a drone and, you know, benefit from that. So yes, we could absolutely do measurements in that spectrum. We would just work with you on a case-by-case -case basis, figure out what your data needs are. And then we develop the plans, the protocols, the methodologies, the equipment, you know, how do we attach it to the drone and how does the drone benefit you more than what's on the ground? Um, that is something we can always work on case by case basis and find a solution for. Yeah, it, it may be wanting for a good test case since I don't think anyone's tried to do it yet. Yep. We'd love we to try testing with you. If you come up with an idea, we'll often provide the service to you for free in exchange for being able to use that as a test case, use that data set, you know, and, and build towards that. We do that. We just did that for another drone mission that is now measuring line of sight from a cell phone tower to a new cell phone tower that's not being built yet. You know, theoretically, they say this, will we actually have line of sight, right? So we'll go out there and we'll do those initial use cases kind of on a pro bono basis because we are benefiting from it. We're growing our capabilities from it. And of course, you have the data that we can collect. You know, we kind of marry that up and we can absolutely work on kind of those one-off and bespoke sort of missions like that. And some bespoke missions grow into, you know, the RF repack program. So absolutely, you as the engineers, if you have a data set you need, we probably have a way that we can start working towards that. You know, that just comes down to us talking together and figuring out what we can do to provide for you. Well, data data, we'll find a way to I'm LA it. based and you guys are friends of mine and this sounds like a cool thing to do. So let's try something, Mr. Chris Hayes. I'll send you my number. Well, I'm, like I'm a retired dude. You need to get somebody who's actually employed <laughs> by a radio station. Well, maybe Bob Matt. Johnson. I, I can't understand what you're saying. I mean, it's ground plane uh, checking. It's very important. I know with AM, that ground plane, it's, that's what sends out your 
how, how much of your energy is going out in the air as opposed to going out, right? I mean, it's it's all about being efficient with a Class A on a big 50K day site. I would imagine those ground planes kind of reminds me of the old days back when we used to be engineers, guys. This wasn't just ones and zeros. <laughs> well, the receivers are never on the ground. So <laughs> when you speak of ground plane, you got to realize we're just talking about a receiver that's going to uh, fly the uh, perimeter of the array. Bob, I thought you had your hand up. Bob Gonsis? Well, yes, I did. Thank you. I, I was wondering how accurate are your measurements of FM and television signals? Uh, have you compared uh, range data on antennas from a manufacturer to what you get on the drone? Yes. Uh, how do you handle ground reflections? Uh, I've done uh, a number of helicopter measurements in years past, and uh, these are questions that routinely come up. So I, uh, if you reach out to Matt or Jim, um, they can get you my contact information. I can send you over one of our real world reports for you to look at. And you'll see the, the way the report is written, there's generally, here's your theoretical pattern, you know, according to the antenna manufacturer and everything that you worked out when you bought it. And then we overlay the pattern verification that we find on top of that. And you can see where the discrepancies are. And inherent to all that is the auditing and checking that goes into that process you know, from our software and, and analysis providers. Uh, are, are, do you measure in the near field, the far field, or the transition zone? Uh, we, we actually can measure in the near field and the far field. Uh, that often varies by mission. Um, I'm not the RF specialist that would tell you on your particular case what that is, but our guy would be able to link up with you um, Alec, one of our chief pilots here, and he will work out that detail with you. Do you need to turn the power down? Can you leave it at 100%? He goes through for step by step with you and helps you understand what your data, what data you're going to get, um, and is there any more data that you need? And he'll develop your flight profiles and plans based off that. Okay, right, so real quick, we're uh, we're reaching 12:45 here, so let's do uh, one last question. Steve, I see your uh, hand up. Then uh, Kevin, maybe you want to throw your contact in the chat as well. Uh, they can reach out to you. And if there's a lot of interest, maybe we can even have a, a separate breakout session or a Zoom um, with engineers. That's kind of what's coming to mind. So Steve, go ahead and then we'll, we'll uh, finish off here. Yeah, just a quick question along your analogy of uh, hauling a, a different trailer behind your uh, drone tractor. Um, we're having a project right now where we're trying to figure out the source of uh, C-band interference to a satellite dish do you have a oh a we should have that have work that? Here. i'm sorry I, I think i was talking over you so the question is do you have anything that uh, that you can attach to that that helps us track down uh energy levels in the c-band spectrum uh yes yeah, i think we, we just step on you kevin you want to take that i'll go after you uh we started experimenting and looking to the c-band when the c-band repack program came about uh, as everybody may or may not know, the C-band repack program, of course, we're filtering out C-band because a lot of that is being reallocated and sold off for 5G expansion. So we do have the ability to measure within C-band and we have some capabilities there. We also do uh, visual mapping of the C-band farm so that we can go back and you can go ahead and look at where all your antennas are facing, what your LSMS elevations are. Um, so we have worked in the C-band space. We have not done that at a massive scale, uh, but on a client-by-client basis, basis, we rarely come across something that we don't already have the starting blocks to build upon for your specific needs, even if it's not one of our at scale missions, like the repack program or the insurance inspection programs or the thermal inspection programs. So yes, we've, we've definitely worked in the C-band space um, and we can get with you on a one-on-one -on -one basis and figure out what specifically you're looking for. And if we can't do it, chances are we know somebody who can and we can at least move in the right direction with that. All right. We have run into a limitation with drones it is a relatively new industry and it does happen um, we're, on relatively rare occasions. We just say, you know what, this isn't doing it yet. Um, we're working we on a we can move off of, you know, back to a terrestrial system to help with that. We're working on uh, just checking our, our polarization of the dish before we uh, go much further. But if that uh, proves out not to uh, resolve our issue where we've had about an eight dB increase in the noise floor, making our EBNO pretty mm -hmm. marginal. Uh, we'll be reaching out to you. Yeah, by, by all means, let us know and we'll get with you one-on-one -on -one and we, we can be pretty responsive to meeting those yeah. needs, you know, as, as bespoke in one office they may be. Please, please do. I, I have to know, we started with the C-Man initiative, uh, a C-Man group with my uh, consortium, Howard Fine, and we, we evolved it to the Spectrum initiative. And I can say unequivocally that there are a lot of 
I think Kevin said this earlier about just trust but verify. Uh, we're finding a lot of instances where the you might have a consulting engineer and they're not, there's mistakes. There's a lot of mistakes that are out there in the paperwork. And we all know that the FCC doesn't care about that. They'll just say, well, you know, you might put an interference complaint, C-band related, turns out you're the one that's going to get in trouble. Um, so, you know, I think that the, on the C-band side of things, I know Howard and I have gone back, I mean, there's a lot of scoff laws out there. They don't even know they're not doing things right. I won't mention them, but it's a problem. And uh, we want to help with that. The measurement side, I appreciate I think it was, who was it uh, that mentioned about the, uh, uh, the antenna calibration side, which I think is very important. Um, I think maybe it was Bob Gonsett, Robert, that might have mentioned that. I think that was really well put. So, um, yeah, I think these are pretty real issues right now. Yes, uh, Mike, and I know I don't didn't mean to go over. It's, I know oh, it's just a quick question. Are you guys going to show at NAB? <laughs> what is NAB anymore? Um, well, it's uh, on it's on hold, but I know it'd be nice to see you guys there. Oh, I would love to come. You guys know me. I would. I mean, I I'd love to come. Whatever you guys want, and 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 you know, we just want to help solve problems. So, heck, um, I'm all for it, Kevin. <laughs> uh, Q Communications had a booth at the last NAB that was canceled. We certainly have every uh, intention of having a booth at whatever the next NAB may be, and whenever that may be, um, you'll certainly find us there as well, either in our booth um, and in partnership with the Open Consortium Tour. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, this video is on our uh, Facebook page. And also, I think we're going to post some of the pictures and videos that you sent me individually. So thanks, Kevin, for being here, Jim. We really appreciate it. Um, great presentation. Uh, if you guys do have interest for another breakout session or something, uh, let me know. And maybe we can get something together with you guys. Um, I know we got more questions, and so do I. So uh, definitely interested in uh, how we can use this in the future. Um, SBE 47, the invite hopefully next week will be coming out for the, the holiday party. So please, you got RSVP to that. We're looking forward to that. Uh, also, I know KSPN uh, 710 has been looking for a contract AM engineer. So just put that out there. Uh, I think I have a contact with someone if you're interested, let me know. And I believe KLAA is also still looking for an operation uh, engineer manager. So um, Matt. The, the, the 710 relocate, which is what KMPC is, could be a very interesting project to uh, try this with because there's going what they're doing for anyone that doesn't know. The 710 site's going to be sold off and going to be diplexed on the current 1110 site. Right. So that's a pretty major build there and it will need a proof of performance. So no, interesting point. And uh, last thing, like the YouTube page. <laughs> Subscribe. We can. Uh... Live. Thanks, everybody. Uh, see you next month for the holiday party, SP47. Have a good one. Thanks.